There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. I am delighted to have back after a long absence one of my very favorite bookish people and certainly bookish podcasters, Anna Bailey Karras, from one of my very most favorite bookish podcasts, Books on the Go, joining us from Adelaide, Australia. And we're here to talk about, well, I'll tell you what we're here to talk about because I need to take a breath and say, Anna, welcome. Hi, Sean. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. It's so lovely. I think this topic is going to work better than the last one. <laughs> Sean just <laughs> reminded me that we've done a New Year's <laughs> Eve book Zoom with two other authors, wasn't Three it? Or four, two authors. Yeah. I'm, we're not authors. Well, you're not an author, are you? Uh, not yet. No, we're not. But there were two authors on the call and it was about New Year's book habits or book resolutions. And Sean had a different memory. I just remembered a lovely chat and Sean said, oh, it was terrible. You you didn't have any New Year's book resolutions. And, and Not only you, no one, none of my guests. I had a panel of, I think, four of you. And uh, none of you had any reading New Year's reading habits. So it's a little <laughs> bit of a dud thematically, but it was still a great bookish chat. Anyway, um, I've invited Anna back for this new series I've recently launched on my channel called Zooming In where I invite bookish social media luminaries like Anna onto my channel for a short chat about uh, some kind of a bookish article. It might be about a writer, might be about something to do with reading, but it's not like a book review of one book, something more general. And I'm really liking the way this series is unfolding. So Anna and I are going to discuss an article from Lit Hub from July 28th called Brief Cultural History of Crying While Reading by Janet Manley. And I looked up Janet Manley a few minutes ago, and she is like a staff writer for LitHub. And since this article was published, I... Editing Sean here. For this factoid to make sense, I need you to know that I filmed this chat with Anna on August 21st, and the LitHub article had been published on July 28th. I counted them. Since this article was published on the website lithub.com on July 28th, she has posted... 16 additional articles. So she wow. is a, or she That's is one prolific. a day almost. Almost. Well, if you count them by business days or whatever, holy smokes. So this is a long <laughs> article about just what it says, a brief cultural history of crying while reading. It starts out with Samuel Richardson and Pamela and Clarissa. And I have some things to say about Clarissa all the way up through Hannah Yanagahara's a little life and so on, right up to the present day. Just, just kind of a, well, I thought a really interesting essay about crying while reading. So, Anna, I promise not to try and make you cry today. <laughs> but what did you think of this article? Go ahead and try. That would be that would be a fun video, Sean. <laughs> there you go. I do have some thoughts. So, I come to this. I didn't read Clarissa. I'm probably chiming in in around the late 1900s. In fact, I can tell you where I appear in the article or where I join the cultural history, it's Bridge to Terabithia. Oh, which I'd never heard of until I saw this article. So. Oh, Sean. Okay. I I really want you to go and read Bridge to Terabithia. I was going to say, now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> well, I'm not giving away any plot spoilers, but that book, I, I have a vivid memory of reading it because it destroyed me and everyone else who's ever read it. I think it was actually one of the first books I remember thinking that was a great book and I would have read it as a, oh, I think I was in primary school. Would I have been about 11 years old? Possibly. Anyway, let's not go too far back in time, but I do have a vivid memory of that. But putting that aside, I sort of am coming into it later you know, thinking more of my later reading life, I would say I'm someone who doesn't cry often in books just as a general view on the topic. And I certainly don't like books that are overly sentimental. So when I think they're trying to get you to cry, the, the John Green type of you give a child cancer in the opening line of the book and that's 
it feels like they're pulling on your heartstrings a bit too much. Um, and the, a recent example of that that I didn't enjoy, as in, even though it was so beautifully written, was Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell. Did you read Hamnet? I have not. I've enjoyed others of other of her books, and I've heard that from a few readers that thought it was a little bit manipulative. Well, I don't know that she intended. I mean, I love Maggie O'Farrell. I wouldn't want to say that she was being manipulative, but you you start off on the blurb knowing that uh, Shakespeare's son in real life and in the book died at about the age of was it nine or ten? I can't remember. And in the opening, and you know that, and in the opening pages of the book, you have a 10-year-old boy bounding down the stairs with that sort of rambunctious energy that 10-year-old boys have. And I think when I read it, you know, my son was about nine or 10. And so it was very, very close to home, very familiar energy and verve that those sort of kids that age have. And I just thought, well, she's doing all of this and we know what she's going to do to this 10-year-old boy. And I don't need to, you know, it was just too distressing. And even though it was a really beautiful book, her style is quite lyrical and quite sentimental. She leans into that, that sentiment. Whereas contrast, I think some books that do move me hardly say anything. It's it's almost between the lines. And one that came, I've got I've got my little list here, Sean, awesome. of books that have moved me recently and possibly That's even fantastic. to tears. But one that I read quite a while ago, and it's hard to talk about. I mean, Little Life is a bit different, but I don't want to give away spoilers for any of these. But there's mm-hmm. one by Ernest Hemingway called Islands in the Stream, which is a later, it was even posthumously published, I believe. And, and it's a story of a man in three stages of his life so one he's on an island then he goes to Cuba and then I've forgotten actually what the third section is and I don't want to say what the event is even though it's obviously very well known that happens in the book but there's a scene where he goes to sit down and it really is just so simply put that he poured himself a whiskey and sat down to read a magazine but he found that when such and such has happened in your life, which we won't spoil, it is not possible to sit and read a magazine. Just incredible. All the all the layers and all the the narrative that that built up to that moment to to and uh, imbue it with so much emotional. It, if you if you're with the story, that's right. It does it's, imbue it with the emotion. But I think but, it's also about that it's true to the character. So that is exactly how a man like that would grieve or how he would experience grieving. And I think my overall take on books, whether they make you cry or not, it's that you're so invested in the character and in the story, but you're you're feeling for that character and you're so immersed with the character that that's it's like a friend in real life, you know, something happening to them, that that's what moves you. And I think that, you know, that book talk, which is they touch on in the article, the crying while reading meme. I don't know if it's, I don't know if they're still doing that, but I do remember we talked about it on the podcast a couple of years ago. That was a thing. I clicked on the link and I don't know how recent the videos are, but there's still a bunch of them there. They probably sure. still are, and it sells books, and I'm all about selling books, so I'm I'm all for it. But I think why it sells books is it's almost shorthand for a promise to you that this book, you will be so immersed in it and you'll be so in with the characters that you will be crying when something happens to them. It will really sweep you away. And I that's why people then go and buy the book because they want that experience of being totally swept away with the story, not because they want to feel sad, but because they want that total immersion or total escape. I'm not someone who'll watch book talk 
well, you know, I'm not allowed on TikTok because my kids tell me I'm too old, <laughs> but I'm not someone who would watch a video of someone crying while reading and think I best I better run out to buy that book because it probably won't be the book for me. Um, and A Little Life, I didn't read for that reason. It just sounded... I, I didn't read it. No, no interest. Too much. Too much. Well, and, and too much discourse. I, I heard so much about that book. I don't need to read it. I feel like I have read it. And in fact, yeah, I, I like did I my my contribution to A Little Life was I watched, actually, it was incredible, the play that's directed by Ivo Van Hove, I want to say, is at the International Theatre of Amsterdam, and it was at the Adelaide Festival this year in March, four hours in Dutch, absolutely incredible, and I I now really feel like I've read the book. <laughs> <laughs> because it was very well, faithful to the book. Oh, it was a drama. It was a dramatization of the novel. Oh, I see. Oh, Sean, it's it was all happening on stage. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think I need that. Um, I, I, I want my fictional narratives to work hard to to get me to that emotional. Like I, I want to put through my paces and. Um, approach the approach the story kind of cynically or skeptically and to be won over by the character work so that mm. I can get into those emotions and I resist cheap shots cheap sentimentality I think I do although I found the John Green novel of the cancer novel quite moving and that was many years ago uh, uh, 10 years ago maybe that I read it and the fault in our stars and it certainly got me but uh, I wouldn't have picked you as a John Green Fan. Well, I have no interest in reading anything else he's written, and now you know I have YA allergies. But yeah, that was one of the first books I read after a twenty-year reading slump, and I thought it was quite quite moving. I have also accidentally made a book talk trying video, but it was on BookTube. I re I did a hot take review of John Boyne's <laughs> The Heart's Invisible Furies. Did you read that? Oh yes. It ends very movingly. And I finished it, and I still had tears rolling down my cheeks, and I turned the recorder on and did a hot take review. <laughs> Brilliant. You were ahead of your time. As, as, as per usual. But I think John Boyne is a slightly, he writes that slightly sentimental style, I think. I'm thinking of the boy in striped pajamas. but Well, which is a very controversial book. And the more that I've learned about John Boyne, I now, I don't, follow him or I wouldn't read anything else he's written. He's kind of a what, what I say, because I'm so disgusted with some of his stances or insensitivity to like trans protagonist or whatever, is um, I have said more than once on my channel, he accidentally wrote a fantastic novel Arts Invisible <laughs> Theories. <laughs> uh, a lot of people loved that book. This article starts back with Samuel Richardson and Pamela, which I haven't read, and Clarissa, which I am on the home stretch of. I've been doing reading it since the 1950s. <laughs> I've been reading it for three or four years, but yeah. um, mostly on audio. And it's a three-volume audio book. And each volume, each of the three volumes is 34 hours. And I'm wow. partway into the third volume. And I do find it quite how, moving. So how many pages would that be i think it's about two thousand pages okay and i don't have a physical book i have ebook but but it's not the book has never uh, i'm like you i don't usually cry maybe my eyes will well up with tears at the very most this book isn't having that kind of an effect on me published what 1748 1768 something like that but the confinement and uh, victimization of Clarissa and her plaintiveness coming through with expert audio narration, it has it has really grabbed me psychologically. Right. It's very compelling. Um, but it's not making me cry. It's just making me really furious that she's yeah. having to go through this. So I'm very much rooting for her and identifying with her. But typically... Sentimentality in older fiction, like 19th Victorian fiction, leaves me cold. How about you? Well, I don't read as much Victorian fiction. I think you read, you're more likely than me to read older books. 
more, as in classics, aren't you? I'm reading Middlemarch at the moment. I don't know okay. if that counts. It does. Absolutely. And For it the has first time, moving so stuff. I don't remember that it made me cry, but there's certainly some moving parts of Middlemarch. I will um, keep you posted. <laughs> right. Better, better, better yet through. to do a TikTok crying video. <laughs> Anna. There we go. Charles Dickens. I, I actually hate Charles Dickens because he's overly sentimental. Ah, okay. I, I okay. I just feel all of his emotional stuff is manipulative. Um, he's. I love David Copperfield, and you know, there's been others, but and his humor, I appreciate. But I, I just, I will not read him because I just think he's one of the, um, one of the Victorian novelists that one could safely just avoid. I and like. Oscar, well, I've yeah, I've only read a little bit of Charles Dickens, and I was pleasantly surprised. But I think. I had in my head that it was a stuffy old classic. This is years ago, stuffy old classic. And, of course, it's quite, you know, he was a funny, engaging writer. So it it um, it was a pleasant surprise. And I quite like his nonfiction, his travel writing. The reason I bring up Dickens is that Oscar Wilde famously said of him, and especially his novel, The Old Curiosity Shop, which I think was the second Dickens book I ever studied, and the protagonist is Little Nell, and she dies a very uh, overly over the top sentimental death as a young girl that takes chapters or pages or whatever. And Oscar Wilde said of the death scene of Little Nell, one must ha- have a heart of stone to read the deaths of Little Nell without laughing. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. That's a- that's kind of how I feel about Dickens trying to trying to move me. Do you want my top three books that most recently made me cry? Please. Okay. I do very much want those. In no particular order, we had Devotion by Hannah Kent. Uh-huh. And some people thought that was too sentimental. I, uh, there was at least one friend of mine or review that I read that thought it was too sentimental, but I was in, I was so invested in the characters, I was immersed, and so I was all in. I I didn't have that reaction to it at all. I just thought it was brilliant. So I went with it when the, the sad things happened. <laughs> um, I was right there. Uh, so that affected me. Uh, the Hummingbird by Sandro Veronese, and I apologise, I've forgotten the name of the translator. And again, it was, I, you know, it is sad towards the end. I thought that was earned. I, I thought it wasn't the point of the novel. I didn't think he was trying to manipulate us. Maybe he was, but I didn't feel that. I just thought I'm with this character. We've lived you know, we'd lived really a whole life with this this character. It was. You, have you read it? No, I have not. Oh, it's. I highly recommend it. I like it. It's a bit eccentric. It's very Italian, so I'm all in for that. And I did get caught by the the ending, and the other one, which is actually a play. So I don't know how I'd go in the theatre, but it's uh, the latest play by Tom Stoppard, Leopoldstadt. Oh, and it's another great example, and it's only about ninety or a hundred pages to read it, and very witty, of course, in parts. But it's a great example of what's not said, and how how minimal you can be if you've earned it, and if you've got the reader or the the audience following this story, following these people, then you almost hardly hardly need to say anything and you will get them um it's uh, incredible the ending is incredible that sounds like a Sean book the one that i will mention i will just talk about one very briefly and that is my top read of the year which you may not know i've already called my top year of the year i called it in maybe may oh and it is a novel translated from the swedish collected works by lydia sandgren Oh. Translated from the Swedish by Agnes Broom. So as not to take up too much time, a very brief synopsis is the mother, who is a gifted academic and artist, leaves her husband and very young family, walks out of their lives 15 years ago and never returns and they never hear anything about her or from her. 
she leaves a note so they know that she hasn't been abducted, but that's about it. They have no idea what's going on. And then we pick up with them 15 years later as they're um, trapped in the mundanity of life and not really dealing with the the hole and the trauma of what happened 15 years ago. And the title is called Collected Work, which is a, such a strange title for a novel. Her husband, Martin, is a publisher and, and a writer wannabe, but he hasn't any books why is this book called collected works she has written some academic books but it's just weird the title and then you get about four fifths of the way in and you find out what the title means and i was devastated <laughs> oh no oh dear just in, a, in the most beautiful way to realize mm. what that weird title for a novel actually means so that's mm. my little tease about this well, that could be good for Women in Translation Month. It could be very good. Although with Women in Translation Month, you got nine days left, and it's a uh, six hundred pages of very tiny print. And the oh. only thing that I didn't like about the book was that it wasn't twice as long. It was a really invigorating chat, and uh, I haven't needed to dab my eyes once. So <laughs> <laughs> I should hope not, Sean. <laughs> I'd be worried, but I do I want cry. you to read. Bridge to Terabithia, and then we'll see. Let I shall do that. <laughs> Anna, thank you so much. Good. Thank you for having me. Ooh.